Uh, Chidi Modi, do you have slides or anything you want to show on the screen, or should we just excellent? I can spotlight your video. Perfect. Yep. You can. Hello. Spot- hey. <laughs> hey guys. Hi. Am I am I pronouncing your name correctly? Because if yeah, I'm not, it, let me know. It's pronounced Chidi Maybe. Chidi Maybe. Great. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh, um, I'm. I apologize ahead of time if my cat suddenly jumps into the camera because it's a cat. I can't tell it what to do. Well, you see, Scott Hartman's dog fine. raised thirty dollars this uh, this morning, so who knows <laughs> what the cat will be able to raise? Perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, right. So Chidu Chidu Mebi uh, is an Anglo Nigerian uh, individual who is currently teaching paleontology and pre-colonial African history online to K uh, through twelve students. Uh, he took Professor Philip Curie's classes on paleobiology and marine mesozoology, and I and has been on several digs with paleontologist Alfredo. Before COVID-19, he was also working in the educational department of the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, helping to educate about deep time. Did I get all of that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was supposed to go on a dig uh, this summer with. Uh, with help from Professor Professor Yorst, Thomas Yorstad, but coronavirus acts right. my field plans. God, everyone's field plans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what I wanted to mainly uh, talk about in, in what I do in teaching K to twelve mm-hmm. is don't under is not underestimating the intelligence of a lot of the younger students because some of the students I have taught can be as young as eight or nine. And a lot of parents initially assume, oh, topics like dinosaurs and science might be too high or too too much. But it all c- turns out, it all comes out to how you break it down into the concepts. Like, right. I've been able to explain, like, I have an eight-year-old who completely understands the concept of phylogenetic bracketing. When oh, it comes nice. To- yeah. So the easy way to explain it, I was like, do you have, a- do you have parents? Right. Yes. Do they have do they have brothers and sisters? Like, yeah, uncles. Then I go ahead to grandparents to help them build a family tree, then help them build the relationships so that they're right. able to uh, to understand uh how phylogenetics work. So that some of the kids who have shown up in my later in my other classes when I go into specific dinosaur families, they're able to initially see the relationships and see at what point certain traits appear in the dinosaur right. lineage. Yeah, like, that is a fantastic metaphor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it's all about using uh, metaphors and, well, similes, I guess, when it comes yeah. to education. Because <laughs> don't treat them like they're dumb. And I usually right. like like to ask them, like, say, uh, let's, let's it's like, hey, what do you think is the solution? What do you think uh, this dinosaur could do? And then I don't tell them that they're wrong. Don't tell them that they're wrong, especially they're young. I would tell them, that's a good idea. Here's what the scientists currently think on that. So, right. yeah, so that way they, they don't feel like they're put down because initially a lot of my students were afraid to ask questions because they didn't want to feel dumb in case they were wrong. Mm-hmm. So, especially since some of them can be as young as eight and as old as 13, so they don't want to feel dumb compared to, well, the teenagers. Yeah. So. So it's always been about making everyone feel like they're on an equal playing field when it comes to talking intelligently about dinosaurs. And right. as, as, I, as I see in the chat, yes, while it's strange that kids, like a lot of parents sometimes underestimate their child's intelligence or the child's capacity mm-hmm. to learn about dinosaurs. Like I once had a homework program when I asked them to research what the scientific names of certain dinosaurs meant. And they started to assume, based on when I would give them a dinosaur name, like, for example, I gave them Triceratops horridus. And they mm-hmm. said, okay. So they said, I asked them, what does tri mean? They said three, Sarah, face, top, uh, and they broke it down to three horned face. I think I mm-hmm. got that order wrong. Uh, yeah. but, but you get the idea. Right. So, <laughs> and... I've, and in relation to the topic for this stream, I have been getting a lot more uh, peop, students of color. Excellent. And the hardest question I ever got asked 
which is actually related to one of the questions I did ask in yesterday's stream when I made my donation, mm -hmm. was they wondered if they could ever actually become a paleontologist because of the color of their skin. They right. felt that that would be a huge barrier to the, mm -hmm. to their achievement. And I, and I said that I'm, I got into paleontology. I've loved dinosaurs since I was a kid. There's, mm -hmm. there's still reason, but the, but the, the argument was you're African, not African American. It's different. It's different mm -hmm. experiences, which is true. I will give them that. So, yeah. And and when the, the parents talk to me about it, because sometimes the parents sit in with the kids to since it's all online instead right. of in a classroom, uh, the parents talked to me and said that they were worried about ba monetary barriers mm -hmm. to education. So mm -hmm. that's why I started recommending stuff like Coursera for when they're older, since the University of Alberta is now actually offering college credits for the wow. Coursera courses. Yeah. Uh, when Professor Curie, the guy who initially ta taught me, uh, right. he, he made an announcement that University of Alberta was actually off, uh, offering the Dino 101 classes, the evolution of birds classes, as actual transferable college credits. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. If you, if you pay for, if you take the paid version, of course, for the right. certificates. Right. But I, I, I said that that's also a reduced financial barrier. And I also highlighted that there's a lot of K to 12 dig field programs that kids right. can go on to. Because when I was right. a kid, that's how I first met Paul Serino. Uh, yeah. I, that's how I first went digging for dinosaurs. I started digging uh, when I was 13. Right. About when I was 13. So you, and I even see in the chat, someone has a certificate, LGBT T-Rex has mm -hmm. a certificate for Dino 101. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that counts as college credits. That's fantastic. So, yeah. So, and also we've ha I have some adults who wanted to get into paleontology, but they fear that, that they need to go all the way to PhD level just to be taken <laughs> seriously. But I, told, I had to explain to them and kids that there are a lot of amateur paleontologists that paleontologists rely on. Like a lot of mm -hmm. the locals who know the area, who know where all the best fossils are found. Not everyone Absolutely. can afford a degree. It's the Id I think the problem is the idea that there's this high ceiling to paleontology. And because a lot of our culture, especially American culture, is so focused on being fiscally secure, especially right. post-recession, they turn away from paleontology. But right, right. yeah, so what? that's what I've been trying to encourage to pursue it and give them avenues in a way that won't allow them, won't hurt them or their parents' wallets. Like I right. mean, probably won't show up in the dream, in the stream, but I did give them like entire, like a huge log of books they can buy. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, like so many sources on different right. things, like paleobiology training programs, uh, Invertebrate paleontology, vertebrate paleontology, even micro paleontology and paleobotany. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I That's well, awesome. the, well, I try to stoke their interest in more than just dinosaurs. Oh, because yes. while I do start out teaching, like uh, if I can share uh, the screen, you, I can. You, sh yeah, I can. You should be able to. Yeah, I can. Uh, let me make sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can show just how many classes I'm teaching. There will be some history in here. But this is how many classes I'm teaching. Oh, wow. Yeah. I. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I teach That's a lot. Amazing. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, but, for those unfamiliar, OutSchool is basically kind of gig economy teaching. Um, but uh, it helps to bring different class types and everything to students from all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm bringing this up because I initially started out with just this, Dinosaurs 101, when I first started yeah. teaching, which was going over the Triassic, Jurassic, uh, early Cretaceous, late Cretaceous, then the mass extinction. But yeah. then students started saying that they wanted to know more about the individual species or individual mm. family groups. So I started making all these other side stuff, uh, okay. even, even on the birds and even uh, the things like the Alvarez source. Right that people mo mostly don't normally think about and even terror right. ones. And then I started to think, okay, now that they've had the gateway, let me introduce them to not just dinosaurs, uh, oh. more like, that's why I had the pterosaurs. Uh, I wanted to call it 
uh, Kurotasai, but no one would understand what Kurotasai <laughs> was. So I put the giant crocodiles. And then I put, I hate to use calling them monsters, but I had to do that. It works. Branding yeah. is a thing. <laughs> yeah. But now I have students learn about ancient things like ancient Gompotheas, ancient oh, wow. things like Basilosaurus, ancient sloths, even ancient prehistoric Cenozoic Australia and Brontotheas and Creodonts. Because I, cool. I want them to broaden the aspect of paleontology. Sure, use the dinosaurs right. as a gateway, but, but say, here's all these other cool things that right. existed in nature. Right. So, uh, and especially since a lot of the parents don't know what these, uh, want to know what these other species are, that's mm -hmm. why I had to get the kids to, I, I let the kids nudge the parents on their own to right. want to take it. And it's hard for the parents to say no when their kids are usually so uh, in, in, invested in learning. On, right. on, one, on one hand, it means they can plop their child for like an hour or two hours or, on the screen where the child won't bother them or pester them. To right. it, it adds to their child's education. Yeah. Uh, and to Elizabeth Scott, yes, I do. I have started teaching them about things before the Mesozoic, like a... Excellent. Like Carboniferous, Devonian, and Permian. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. The more we highlight the weirdos of the Paleozoic, the better, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Um, Although they love the tri the Triassic uh, crocodile forms, because they and and my students got a new slogan when they learned about all the different niches that all crocodile forms occupied across from the meso to the seno. They said yeah. crocodiles can't catch a break because in every niche, something better shows up. Right. <laughs> they pretty much locked down the river predator niche, but beyond that. <laughs> yeah, but even in the river predators, you still have hippos. <laughs> hippos right. come up exactly. and, and just, so yeah, so, because when I showed them ocean dwelling crocodiles like the Metriorhynchus, uh, right. and after, that came after, I believe, how do I call it? The Machimosaurs. Do I have that right? The Machimosaurs, yes. Mm -hmm. The crocodiles that, so. that, came, that came before the Metriorhynchids. Right. Uh, I, I was like, well, there's Lyopleurodon and all the Pliosaurs in the ocean, so they're not going to become the top predator at any point in time. Right. Uh, so, so, I was like, so, the, so <laughs> they have a bad rap. And, and, now they, and now I have students who love Abelisaurs, that's Excellent. not that that aren't just Carnotaurus. Right. And, yeah. Like they, they even like Rugops because they think they find Rugops as the underdog of the Chem Chem formation. Oh my God. <laughs> They're not wrong. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, <laughs> it's all about presenting uh, dinosaurs in interesting lights, not, try, not just trying to highlight how cool they were that is one aspect but if you try to list right. every dinosaur as cool that will make them i guess seem boring but i try mm -hmm. to highlight yeah. <laughs> the, the uniqueness of each dinosaur family and how and how it looks and one of the things right. i do like to teach is about paleontological history mike every student i've had after telling them about teaching them about the bone wars has hated the guts of edward drinker cope at othmeal charles marsh <laughs> as they should <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and they and they all disparage what ha the lack of credit Mary Anning got in her lifetime. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But one of the things, the hardest thing with teaching about paleobotany to kids is because plants might not seem all that interesting, especially to young kids. Right. So I I frame it in a way in how the way the pa uh, paleo flora changed affected dinosaurs and other fauna how right. it changed their diets and how it made certain species go extinct like when i talk about the rise of the hadrosaurs and the uh, ability to chew and the kind of plants right. that were there that made those show up and stuff like that right. so if you're going to talk about something that's not the cool paleo stuff it's about mm -hmm. how okay how does this not cool thing dramatically change and affect the cool thing right yeah and yeah yeah and the, the, and one of the things is i'm so glad that that zoom has a mute function because sometimes i would have all my all my students sometimes i could have 20 at once try to ra raise their hand and say something when i've had to tell them 
come, okay, let's pause. It's that student's turn. It's that student's turn because all the students want to suddenly blurt out something they know or something they want right. to ask because they're excited. Uh, like, I can't, so I don't feel like this, I don't like to discipline them. I just like to pause in a calm voice and say, it's that person's turn. I'll get to you in a bit after that person has had his t turn. So that, and over time, a lot of my students have been more quiet and, and been more patient in waiting. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of people who are uh, really interested in what you have to teach and everything, uh, can we get a link to your OutSchool uh, page just because there are people who are interested in it? Uh, okay. Uh, let me just find my, my page on OutSchool as it's right. displayed when I just put, put my name. You should be able to send it to me in the chat, I think. Okay. Um, All right. So, or yeah. If not, uh, or if not, then uh, email because it looks. Oh. Oh, wait. Yeah. Bobby's got it. Oh, wait. Never mind. We found it. Yeah. We are a crack team. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, let's see. Do we have any excellent um, questions in the chat so far? I don't, I'm not seeing any. Um, yeah. but yeah, it sounds like you're doing amazing stuff. It's really great. I, um, per personally, I wish I had more resources to use because when I was going right. to go into the field, uh, right. my plan was to actually teach a class while in the field and showing them exactly how the, the process right. works, because I do teach like paleontology and not sure on how to become a paleontologist, what's done in the lab. And right. I wanted, and it's it fun to gauge by telling all the boring stuff that happens. I like to see if they're still interested. And a lot of them are still interested, even in the boring, even when you go with the quote unquote boring stuff, like the papers, when I've told them about right. how peer peer review works and, right. st and, st and stuff like that. And they're still interested, especially with the way technology has been creeping forward. And, 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 and especially when I tell them stories of how paleontologists used to think certain dinosaurs <laughs> look, like when I tell them how what they thought of Therizinosaurus, Dinochirus, and Spinosaurus, right. they they usually bust bust a gut. But I tell them that science <laughs> always changes, so right. they have it in the idea that okay, this is what they think now. That is uh, subject that is possibly subject to change. And LBT Rex, I'm not sure if Out School has an age limit exactly. Uh, you'd have I don't. To show it. <laughs> And, in theory, it doesn't. Yeah, and um, while yeah, while yes, it is a gig teaching, I'm still honestly getting uh, better results than my time doing at regular adjunct stuff. Okay. Because I get to set my own hours for one thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, be, and, be, and I get paid per student as opposed to a flat rate. So fair enough. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm technically on out school. I just haven't been teaching because I am overwhelmed by it. <laughs> overwhelmed? But, uh, what do you find overwhelming specifically? Oh, just the process of setting up a class. I've had so many other things like on my plate that just sitting down to start it mm -hmm. is a, you know, leap that I haven't had time to make. But I'm, it's really cool to see how many things you've done on there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it wasn't easy building up to how many classes I yeah. I got because it was confidence putting yourself out there on the internet, right. and right. then especially when uh, I don't have the same level of credentials as Professor Yorstad or Professor Serino or Professor Curie or even Professor Holtz. Uh, right. Does, sometimes, they, am I qualified? Like before I even started, honestly, I actually asked Professor Holtz, who has been taught me a lot of stuff as well uh if he if i if he thought i was fully qualified to start teaching he's like i know you and i've I, i've known you for for a while you can you can teach i i trust you to teach thanks, us. thanks. <laughs> i definitely wasn't pushing for that but thank you yeah um yeah. yeah. What? How do you like get inspiration to the different kinds of classes you're going to teach? Is it based on like student response or ideas you have? It's a mix of the two. In my first classes, when I had, I would see what worked and what didn't, what students responded to, uh, better. Right. 
and how best to pace things because I didn't want to give them too much information and how to let things breathe naturally in the class. Right. So it was a bit of a trial and error and error process. Mm-hmm. But over, t- over the months, I, for lack of a better phrasing, I have it da- almost down to a science. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, I agree with Lira Scholar in the chat. We do need to get, the, get rid of the idea that paleontology is kid stuff. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, uh, because when I was at the Smithsonian, uh, I had several black kids, 18 year olds, walk up to me mm-hmm. and they told, they told me that they wanted to learn about dinosaurs and they asked if I could be the mentor. They actually asked that. And I right. said, there's more qualified people. They said, we want you because you're the only person of color that we see here. Right. Uh, not that I was the, I'm not, I'm not the only person that worked in the deep time hall. It's just that I was the only one on duty at that time. Right. Because I would, right. Us, I would usually take whole day shifts and usually end up ans- talking to about sometimes up to 2,000 people a day answering right. their questions about, about dinosaurs, which is actually what made me feel personally qualified to start teaching online because if I could handle standing and talking to thousands of people, I could definitely stand sitting in front of a computer safe at home. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, docenting and volunteering at museums definitely gives you a lot of hands-on experience and experience that people don't consider all the time. Yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah. Everyone's still talking about taking your class as adults. (laughs) Pretend you have kids. Just pretend you have kids, guys. Yeah. But if if I was to teach as adults, I would go into the more advanced stuff because a lot of the stuff I still teach is sort of on the more basic intro level for the families and species like uh like i think the most comp some of the most complicated stuff like i don't talk about the anorbital fenestra or stuff like that that's right. more an advanced topic i do talk about more obvious traits like when i talk about the t-rex for example tyrannosaurus i do talk about the the teeth and how and the spites and the and and how much force and pressure it could apply right. i'm, I'm right. not go- i'm not going to talk about the fused skull that would have right. allowed for for more force. I just, like I said, I try not to talk down, but I still think I still think there are certain topics you can reserve for a lot older people, like right. like how often would a child remember the word premaxilla? For probably example. not often. Yeah. <laughs> so they do remember complicated dinosaur names fairly well. So there's that. They they remember the names and remember the dinosaurs, but some concepts. I still think are reserved for the are reserved for older ages, right? In my, right. In, my in my opinion, but I still try to teach them enough that one parents complained that I had too many classes and they ended up and they felt their ears were burning from how much stuff their child was telling them. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And as for some of the resources I use to teach them, I do use a mix of slides, clips, and documentaries good documentaries none of that jurassic fight club stuff thank you <laughs> yeah that's, uh, you'd think i wouldn't have to say it but thank you <laughs> and and yeah i do sometimes use much older documentaries to get the point across but i do tell them that the documentaries are outdated are outdated first of all so that before getting the concept across like whenever i've used uh, when dinosaurs roamed America, right. or uh, walking with dinosaurs as a right. classic, Be- right. mm-hmm. because because walking with dinosaurs honestly has one of the best impressions of our source sauropod interactions from the Ballad of Big Al. Right, right. It's also got yeah. the best soundtrack. It's yes, true. <laughs> that is true. Oh, one thing I do want to share as an image: the largest fossil we found when I was digging with Professor Serena. I can share yeah. that. Excellent. Yeah, please. Yeah. This is when we 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 were hunting in Montana, mm. and we we were looking in some Jurassic beds. Right. That that's me sitting right next to right next to the bone after 
you can see but my hands are completely soaked in white from putting the plaster helping put the plaster over this wow. entire fossil that's awesome yes yeah. yeah we had I to dig it. out the whole area just to get at that fossil and I, and I and I try to show this to my to my students to show them that there's so many kids that are ve much very young that are here with us right that 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 can go so it's not just the adults kids can kids can go yeah uh, mm -hmm. although i have had kids recently ask me about that uh dinosaur that illegal fossil trade documentary oh, and i told them never do that it belongs yeah. in the museum because they asked what's wrong with private collections because they were like oh i have because they because <laughs> like, no, some kids were like i have a trilobite i bought a trilobite on the market uh, my, yeah, um, that's different. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, that's I, I did try to say like trilobites are really super common, and some of them can be casts of the actual specimens. Uh, right. But like, there there are lots of fossils that are quite common, and it's not as big of a deal as owning, you know, very important specimens that we don't have a lot of, yeah. like. Dinosaur teeth are sold on the market, and I'm just sitting here like, how? <laughs> oh, I... teeth fall out a lot. Yeah. To we, answer a little scholar in the chat, I'm trying to remember, yeah. but I believe that fossil we found belonged to a Camarasaur because we were looking in some Jurassic beds, and I remember, like, just a f like near a mile over, we had found some Stegosaur plates. Not the rest of the Stegosaur itself, but just the plates. Uh, and I do have one more image from my time in Montana to show, and that's yeah. when I when I had found a single fossil. I uh, when, when we had gone up to some Cretaceous beds, and I uh -huh. found a small Ceratopsian, but I had already wrapped it in plaster, as you can as you can see, taking care. And I yeah. have some some micro fossils in in that little handbag, because I do try try to tell them about. And I told them one of the fun ways to find to tell the difference between fossils and rocks that some paleontologists once used was right. taste was putting it on the tongue, the actual putting it on your tongue, because a fossil will stick to your tongue, but a rock won't most of the time. Right. And I right. told them, and I told them, don't do that. Fossils taste horrible, and don't eat a fossil <laughs> unless you're a medieval Chinese doctor, who who, who will grind <laughs> fossils to use them for medicine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I I'm always amused that a major part of geology is licking rocks. <laughs> that will uh, never not be amusing. <laughs> yeah, I still remember the, the taste of like. Mm. That's it. <laughs> I have a hint of the Cretaceous, but maybe Massachusetts or Campanian. <laughs> maybe right. do like a little geological tasting right there. Right, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, do we have any more chat questions? Or did I? Oh, uh, Will Pod, I did at once accidentally inhale a prehistoric turtle by accident. <gasps> yeah, <laughs> yeah like, like, like it had broken down and it become dusty. I, I, when I was coughing, I accidentally took a deep breath and some of it got in my nose. Amazing. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, I breathe in a pretty turtle. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. So I think one of the ways to also entice people to paint on is how much easier it's getting to find fossils. Like, right. we're no longer just looking at old photos and maps. We now have GPS points. Like, because the last time I went, uh, I forget the name of the device, but it was like this little satellite tracker thing. So whenever we would right. find a good site, we would ping it so that and it would be sent to a cloud database so that next time if, if if we had to end that season we could just come back based on the satellite uh geo positioning coordinates and just start from there right so so that's so it's like okay technology is making things a lot easier and some kids and there are a lot of kids who said that they want to dig go into the field but they have health issues like right but I said that you don't always have to go into the field but to study dinosaurs. You can still mm -hmm. work in the lab. 
and right. can, and you can st and because of computers now we have like 3d imaging scans and stuff like that you can use you can literally request a 3d print of a fossil like right. I, my guy my boss at the Smithsonian have literally uh made it so that you can actually 3d print every single dinosaur in the collection for free if you already oh, have wow. a 3d print yeah you can you are legally allowed to 3d print replicas of all the smithsonian's collections because Excellent. when the when the pandemic uh came out we they wanted to make all that uh knowledge available so they still have us host little educational streams on the smithsonian's website uh okay. i'm not i'm not sure if this the smithsonian sends out email but for anyone who wants to learn about stuff in our collections they they we host streams like even on the insect right. pavilion and um, and we even have now virtual tours of the Smithsonian. Right. Excellent. Have you been able? Have Have you been enjoying the uh, new Smithsonian Deep Time Hall? Oh yes. Uh, it's actually, I I like the way it's laid out more. Although personally, I think that a lot of people miss more of the Cenozoic stuff. Like we have a woolly mm -hmm. mammoth that people often miss because it's behind the 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 ground sloth the right. shasta, the shasta ground sloth people often right. a, often ask me if that's mega theorems like no that's a we have a different this is a different sloth we have and mm -hmm. like we have a megaloceros and that's was also hidden behind but because everyone's like beelining straight for the dinosaurs like the right. chimerosaurus uh and diplodocus and and all that stuff they often miss it and right. also and also there are some dinosaurs that, that are hidden like we have a ceratosaurus battling a stegosaurus at our exhibits, but it's gotcha. behind, it's way far behind that you wouldn't notice unless you decide to go around the Camarasaurus or around the Tyrannosaurus, for example. Right, right. But I still think some things could be done better, but it's much better than what we had, because yeah, some things are still missed. That that you might miss it on on your first turn, like. I, I've had to point out our pteranodon to a lot of people because a lot of people walk <laughs> past it because it's it is placed high up near right. the ceiling. So a lot of people miss it until I have to point out we have a pterosaur. <laughs> we have a pterosaur in yeah. our collection. So that's yeah. it, it's still really cool that you get to like be there every day and point out all the new stuff to everyone. Mm -hmm. Although yeah, there's some days when it's. Um, taxing uh because oh oh dear lord this this might make you laugh uh, okay <laughs> there was a day when there was a religious convention an interfaith convention happening in dc that day and then yeah. we had a lot of buddhist monks jehovah's witnesses and a bunch of other people come into come into the museum because yeah. while they were waiting for him, and they ended up asking me a lot of questions. So, and, and we've been trained. We had to get specific training before, before they before they were arriving on how to handle certain specific religion related right. questions, <laughs> and, right. and biting and mentally biting our tongues. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, because of certain assertions, they would make like someone. Some people would ask. Where are you hiding the giants? I'm like, oh, the giants? God. This is, they're asking, where are, you, where are you hiding the bones of the giants of people like Goliath, you know, like from David and Goliath? And I was yeah. like, so confused. Like, where are you hiding the giant humans? I'm like, are you looking for our Neanderthals? Or, or <laughs> it's, it's in a different hall. They're like, no, the giants. And I'm like, and I actually had to go to take them to the directors. Like, they're looking for giants? I'm so confused. But oh, then I realized gosh. that, but it wasn't just that. And over, I, I get a, I would get a couple of those each month. Right. And, 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 and especially when the Jehovah's Witnesses come or people with, uh, who, who, who do not like the, what they call the lie of extinction. Uh, right. Uh, oh, man. Uh, how they would put it is that, uh, God's works cannot be destroyed or become extinct, so we must be hiding. Uh, we we must have built all of this all to uh, to to fool them and make people, uh, as they put it, sheeple. I think that's the word they were using. Um, <laughs> there's so much to unpack there. Oh, probably okay. a suitcase to burn instead. 
<laughs> you handled oh, it expertly, though, and I'm very impressed. Yeah, I would have just gone nope and walked away. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I didn't have. I didn't have a choice, especially a liberal scholar. I remember Chat telling him the day Fox News came to the Smithsonian and put me under a mic and started asking me questions. Oh no! Oh no! Uh, oh, I, no. And I had to call to my superiors. And like, like um, Fox News is here. What do I do? Oh god! I I've been ghostwriting myself at the funerals in for a really long time, and I've never had anything that crazy. I'm amazed. Is it because you're in the in the capital? Like I know it was because it's DC. It, it was because it's DC, and the last time I was there, the Fox News showed up again because they wanted to. Uh, because we still had the museum open before it closed down, they right. wanted to show that because the museum was open, see, there's nothing to worry about COVID nineteen. Oh, that was when no they were. Way. That's when they were downplaying it. Right. So um, they, they uh, wanted to show, look how safe uh, things are. I I am sorry that you had to deal with that situation. <laughs> well, well, like I said, we had training to deal with, as they put it, belligerent individuals. There we go. That's a nice word for it. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes we have rassles, like, sometimes we'd have kids, like, try to run through the museum, and that's a bad idea because they can crash. There's tons of people that can crash into someone. So I've often had to take a loud tone, which I don't like to use on kids, but I thought I use a loud tone or they crash. Right. And, because, and, oh, true story. Because the Brachiosaurus femur that we have is out in the open, We've had people try to lick the Brachiosaurus. Um. <laughs> no, you're licking um, the fossils in the field. And, <laughs> and, there were, and there were these teenage girls who, oh, Christ, uh, who thought it would be a good idea to pose and hump the Brachiosaurus female. Oh, come on. I wish I was joking. I'm, I'm sorry. I... I'm sorry that the only thing I have to say in response is apologies for these people I do not know. <laughs> so, yeah, so oh that's why... God! That's why I sympathize a lot with retail workers. Because yeah. of all the stuff they have to see and, and deal with. Because, like, they probably have to deal with a lot crazier people than me. Like, especially oh. with people who have those, um... What do you call it? Those things to extend when they're trying to take, uh, photos selfie sticks yes those things <laughs> they're not allowed but people come and do it anyway so of course and the worst thing that happened on one day when i was going going on duty was there was a child that had who, who was on his dad's shoulders you know cat child carrying his shoulders so people usually crowd around the t-rex so one guy was trying to turn and he accidentally swung hard enough that he knocked the kid off his father's shoulders uh... so Thankfully, the dad was able was able to quickly turn around and catch the kid in time, but uh, okay. but uh, but we're like we had to take a stronger position on no selfie sticks. And whenever we have to close out, normally security has to close out the museum. Uh, uh, but they actually uh, now whenever I'm on duty, they actually ask me to help out close at the time hall because because uh, I used to be a theater kid, so I can project right. my voice mm -hmm. really far. Because a lot of right. people try to sneak in and hide so they can take more photos and hide and uh, just do more, uh, see more of the museum when it's closing time. Right. So uh, I don't know if, if I'm allowed to raise my voice considering that I'm doing a stream. But I basically do like saying aloud in a projected voice, the hall is now closing. Please exit the museum. <laughs> and, I sat, and I have to say it in English, in French, in Spanish, and Thai. And, nice. in, uh, and in Arabic because of how many international people would right. come, especially because we have a lot of Boy Scout and Girl Scout groups that would come to the museum. Right, right. Yeah. So, oh, man. Mm -hmm. And it was especially interesting whenever we had a lot of French students so that they would have a good, they would say, hey, we have a French group. Gee, maybe you speak French. You're on duty. <laughs> oh, no. I'm mm. so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I think I, I just realized I've gotten away from talking about teaching, just paleontology, and gone to teaching at the museum. Although I mean, it's, 
it's all your experience and it's all wonderful to hear about. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, but a lot of the ki kids do, I, but I am happy that especially the, and this, and not to single them out, but I have a lot of black girls who want to join parentology. Right. Oh, that's and, wonderful. And honestly, uh, no, no disparagement to any of my non-black girl students, but that <laughs> fills me the most with pride. Of because, course. Yeah. So, uh, because, and I, t and I, I often tell them, like, a, like when, when they heard about Mary Annie, they wanted to talk to me after class because they felt mm -hmm. like they would, like they would receive the same obstacles for being black and being female. But right. I told them that, uh, that there, if that they shouldn't let that get them down, there will be obstacles. That just means that that you technically have more to prove, and that they're more afraid of you. Because, right. Yeah. Because I, I remember the paper, the article that came out about diversity in the geosciences, right. and how it needs to do better. That right. means recognizing the financial hurdles a lot of people have, because no one wants to take student debt anymore right. especially because i guess this is going to be the second recession we've had in the span of in the span of a decade so yep isn't it great <laughs> yeah so a lot of people are not going to want to what's the one i'm looking for pony up the money so that's right. why i try to provide all these less financially harmful right. resources to kids and their parents especially right uh and that's why i try to make my classes low cost uh, I still get I still get paid a lot. I still make way, have no students to pay my bills, but by lowering the right. entry fee, like right. to let them learn, the parents get less spooked and they help right. encourage. So and and because I'm able to get a ton of students, I'm still uh, making enough. Like you know, in art school, they tell you to charge like forty eight dollars per student. Sometimes I usually just charge like ten to twelve bucks, right? Uh, right. Because I want because I'm more like let them let them come especially with the COVID 19 mm. they're not really going to have 40 parents are not really going to have 48 dollars to throw away that easily 10 bucks right. they're, they're more willing to consider absolutely and i've had parents who've been like i'm sorry can i have a refund uh ten dollars is too much for me to pay because we need to pay our bills and i'm like take the refund you need it what yeah you you need it and, and i had to be uh understanding of that which actually made the parents pay more in, in the long term uh, right because i was more willing so be willing so they should be more willing to work with parents and mm -hmm. i think a lot more of the online format can also work especially for kids who can be on the computer more especially if they right. can't afford to go to classes things like coursera things like out school because i'm not the only one teaching about dinosaurs on out school right uh it's just it's just that and the people who've been teaching longer than me, I'm just the new guy because I'm the African te I'm the African teacher who's teaching about paleontology. Right. And one thing I do want to talk about in regards to that was that I didn't I had some barriers when I wanted to learn about paleontology initially because in mm -hmm. Nigeria there was growing up in Nigeria there was no real paleontology education program. Uh, but my mother uh, was was tried to pull out all the stops for me, get all the best books for me, take send me, take take me to England to visit all the museums to to encourage my love of it. And even though she's like, you want to be a paleontologist, I'll support you. It may not be the most financially viable, I will still support right. you. Even though That's I didn't even though I end up taking a master's degree in administration and political science and history. And I, yeah. ended up, and I ended up being an IRS agent for a few years. Oh, wow. Uh, she, yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I still, I still help people with their taxes for free. Uh, I because mean, of, because of that. But those got to get paid. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, to uh, join Tumel on the chat, I do have a YouTube channel, but on that YouTube channel, I teach pre colonial African history on that one. Uh, because like, anyways. Anyways. that's really cool, though. Like, <laughs> well, need it's more the, education about that. Yeah. It's the well, the YouTube channel is the same name that I'm using here, Afro Historian, where where I where I sometimes give 
uh, lectures. I like because I like to teach about pre-colonial history because everything about when it comes to Africa is then the Europeans showed up and and did all this. I'm like, there's a ton of there's a ton of stuff that happened in between. I also like to teach about mythology, so right. that the so that the stories don't die. Because with my mm-hmm. people, my language, my mother tongue is Igbo, and right. a lot and a lot of our stories are fading because a lot of the how do you griots our version of griots like the official storytellers they're dying out and no one wants to pass on to become a griot because oh jeez so I would actually go around to my to my people and I literally said give me all your stories and I will literally post them on YouTube. So that even though you die, the stories won't die. They'll stick That's they'll still exist in some form. So I want to still teach all this history. And I've been teaching history of other cultures, not just my tribe, so that I don't show an obvious bias. <laughs> no, that's so, so that's really awesome. Like yeah. to the point I don't have accurate word for how amazing yeah. that is. Like I'm currently trying to create an episode on the Songhai Empire, okay. and and in some of my podcasts, uh, people I do, I do sh- show the Europeans, and they do come at the end because it is <laughs> they do have to show. But I like to talk about all the stuff. Like I remember teaching about the Dahomey, and I it literally took, I literally had three episodes on just the Dahomey and the 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 Amazons, the, the warrior women. Nice that that they had. I even gave lectures at Balticon uh, about uh, about it as well as Excellent. stories. But I think it's also important to teach pre-colonial African history to teach them that Europe isn't the end-all be-all when it comes to Africa. There right. were a lot of important societies. And right. back to the barriers uh, I had, a lot of people thought that it was weird that I wanted to learn about dinosaurs because Nigeria is a very conservatively religious country, 50%, right. 49% Christian, 50% Muslim, one percent mm-hmm. tra- traditional religion, so and they didn't think that dinosaurs well existed because Nigeria doesn't really have a museum of natural history, as mm-hmm. my mom once put it. Paleontology is the luxury is the luxury of a more economically developed society. Yeah. Since 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 because Nigeria has a lot of poverty issues. Right. So who's going to want to invest in a natural history museum and stuff like that? Uh, so that's why it's not as encouraged. There's, there's a huge fossil market in Nigeria, but it's often sold to European traders. Uh, like I remember uh, right. sometimes on the black market, like I remember finding, going through the market and finding a Niger source. And I wanted to give right. it to inform my teacher, but it already got bought by an auctioneer. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the chat, I think Joan asked if you've seen Lost Kingdoms of Africa. No, I have heard of it, but I want to, but I do want to see it. Uh, and uh, and often, whenever I try to go and get my resources, I do go to the African Art Museum of the Smith, the African Museum of the Smithsonian, because I have a a library card there and I have a library pass right. to go there and get all the information and research. Right. And and I do sometimes donate artifacts to that museum. Like <laughs> once this pandemic ends, uh, I actually I actually have I'm actually going to have in my possession uh, the actual the actual writings of I'm trying to remember his name, Ibn Falamin, the one of oh no Usman Danfordio. The guy who okay. started started the Fulani Caliphate. I'm actually going to have his writings in my his actual writings in my possession before I donate them to the Smithsonian. Cause, oh wow! Yeah, because my one of my uncles is a descendant of Usman Danfodia. Wow. Oh wow! Yeah. So uh, that's going to be a donation to. That's going to be an interesting thing to hand over. And uh, one of the jokes I received was, "Here's this Nigerian. Are you one of those Nigerian princes that wants to donate this?" <laughs> Ancient artifact to this museum. <laughs> I'm sorry that you not responded with that. Uh, like I and I told them no Nigerian prince jokes. It's like why is that racist? Like no, it's dated and overused. <laughs> <laughs> like I, oh, I'm sorry. That is awful. Yeah, but Niger, but 
while Nigeria doesn't have much of a parent entrepreneur, Niger does now. Okay. Uh, our neighbor. Uh, uh, trust me, whenever I talk about Niger, the internet uh, usually thinks I'm talking about another thing. <laughs> because, oh, of, because of how it's spelt. Right. Uh, but one of the things I've been talking to my students about recently is when it comes to national fossil ownership because of right. the history of where those fossils came from because they were because right. they were like why doesn't egypt display because some kids were asking why doesn't egypt display spinosaurus why do, why was it sent to germany uh right. when, when they were when i was teaching them about spinosaurus and i talked about stroma and the spinosaurus and how it got destroyed in world war ii and, right. and, and stuff like that yeah and as Walt put said uh, wanted to censor nigerosaurus for the same uh reason yeah. Oh, right. so, so when they so, so yeah and, they, and i was and they, they're interested to learn about who real which nation really owns the fossils and stuff like that uh right. and in yeah although in nigeria we get a lot of uh marine fossils because for most nigeria's time it was under sea level right so we don't have much in the way of dinosaurs i believe except dinosaurs that got washed out to sea ah uh, okay so that that's as far as i know for Nigeria, it's, it's mostly marine stuff, which which is still which is still fine, right? Uh, uh, so, but and also, a lot in Nigeria, evolution isn't banned per se; it's just frowned upon sometimes when it okay. comes to discussion. So, a lot of times when I talked about dinosaurs, I had to keep the evolution. When I was in Nigeria, I had to keep the evolution aspect a bit on the down low. In a bit right. when talk when talking about it, and like I remember my mother before she first saw a fossil, she didn't believe that dinosaurs actually existed until my father took her to uh, the, the museum in London, uh, right? To, uh, to show to show it to her. So that's all, that's all the difficulty about talking about paleontology in some African countries because of a multitude of uh, factors, right? Yeah, but. Still, it sounds like your background and everything helps you to navigate that a lot better than other people can. Yeah, which is good. Yeah, I think the the most notable fossil we have uh, from from Nigeria is uh, Sokoto Sokotosuchus, which was found in the Sokoto area, and it's a well crocodilian form. It's a Massachusetts mm -hmm. crocodilian form. And okay. while it, while it was found, uh, I believe it, it was found in Dukamaje. Uh, in the Dukamaje formation, uh, there's not much papers on it because, well, Niger Ni Nigerian scientists don't want, don't aren't doing much with it, right? And so it's been sent to America. So that's so that's one of the corners. Like, do you keep it in Nigeria where it, it belongs to Nigeria, or do you give it to the uh, Americans, the Europeans, the Chinese, where they would have more available resources to study it? Right. Uh, some of the one student actually suggested a novel solution that since three D printing is a thing now, why not right. let let the Nigerians keep the original but give give all the other museums like a full three D data print of yes. it? Um, I think that's probably the best solution. It's fantastic. Agreed. So that yeah, so that way nations get to keep their original uh, material, right? But, but the p places which have the more advanced scientific equipment to study it can print out all the papers they like while giving credit to where right. it's from acknowledging the original owners agree like we could also like i think in the same vein that we've talked about giving back artifacts and everything to the cultures they came from we should probably start giving back fossils to the places they came from and then using 3d printing to continue to study them yes it's so, also probably easier to display Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah, probably much easier to display. I can't share it, but I, I uh, but because I, I don't have the photo up. But I, I, w if I would, I would have been able to show you the collections we have in storage at the Smithsonian when when wow. we we're, were putting things on our last day before the COVID thing is. Because I remember yeah. having to shovel a triceratops skull that was oh, heavy because yeah. it, it was an adult, so not exactly yeah. the lightest thing to shovel to help move along right yeah that's uh oof. and the yeah. beauty of 3d printing is that usually it's lighter than rock mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah 
and it's differently textured, especially because right. some people have asked how to tell the difference between a cast and bone, and I tell right. them about the physical features and details that they can visually observe, right? In order right. to tell the difference, but also at the Smithsonian, we literally have a thing that says, uh, "Great." Gray means cast, white means bone. Yeah, we, we have that too, yeah. <laughs> People yeah. really appreciate that. Because I don't know about you, but the biggest question I get is always, is this real? And it's yeah. like... I, I, do, I, do, I do get that. And, but one of the things we do have to help explain why we don't display everything is we technically have two stegosaurus on display. The cast, mm. that's to sh the cast that of it fighting the ceratosaurus and the us uh, and we have a census right in front of our lab where it's uh it's still in the way it was found when it was dug up so it's still haphazard right yeah oh so and i i would like to point for anyone who actually wants to volunteer in the museum that they do have lab opportunities where they will train you to actually uncover some of the specimens we have a gorgosaurus that we've been spending months uncovering so we, the Smithsonian will offer training for that. And for those who are worried about the financial thing, you technically get to claim every train, train ticket or miles you, you drive to the Smithsonian uh, is tax deductible. So oh, wow. if, you want, if you want an incentive. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's the IRS agent still, still in here. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you for that excellent tip. Um, so technically we have another guest scheduled for 11, but if you want to keep talking for a bit, you absolutely can. Sure. Or, uh, if, or if, if you he, want to head out, you can do that. If he, <laughs> if he, if he doesn't mind, and if, if he doesn't mind, I can still talk about, if, I can still answer any more questions if anyone has any. Right. Oh, yeah. uh, Tyler, one of our organizers is going to have a question in a second. Okay. Um, yeah. So we got that. Yay! Um, we just gotta wait for the email to come. In. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, I love the idea that your student came up with, with for the three D printing. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, by, by far. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Just waiting for the yeah. question. Yeah, although one of the things that has been infuriating me and a lot of other African uh, mm -hmm. dino nerds, and especially right. or anth anthropology nerds. Uh, specifically, we have Benin, Benin bronzes are really important to Nigeria from the Kingdom of Benin. Uh, right. the, Brit the British are currently refusing to hand them back to us. They're saying that we'll, lo we'll loan you back your stuff because we, but I don't think you can fully appreciate uh, the, the Benin bronzes, even though it's like we built them, we designed right. them. I think. Yeah, it's. It's not good. I yeah. agree. And, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, British Museum. Yeah, and especially when they, I, I'm half British, so this is, but I still side with my Nigerian half uh, oh, most yeah. of the time. But, <laughs> I, I guess the voice was a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> well, I was 100% uh, British. I would side with the Nigerians. Yeah, I'm, I'm 25% Scottish, and I side with the Nigerians. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm spe I'm specifically a Highland Scot as far as descent goes. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm a Lowland Scot, sadly. Um, <laughs> okay. The question: I wanted to know if there are any dedicated orgs or movements we can support that are similar to the Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs for Nigeria and other African countries with fossils. There is nothing for Nigeria specifically, but I do believe there's some, for, I don't know the names, but I know there's one for Egypt and okay. there's one for Niger. Okay. And because Egypt is now getting famous with the Kem Kem uh, formation and Morocco. Yeah, Morocco has okay. one. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, if we ever get around to being able to do this kind of streaming for charity thing again, we'll definitely include those in our donation link. Um, yeah. Do we have any other questions, guys? Yeah. I, I do have one more little British thing to say. Uh, okay. When the, when the British asked where, people have also asked where are Africa's great architectural works. And I do have to point out the British blew them up with their cannons. Uh, <laughs> because if you ever look up the, the walls of Benin, 
when they were made, if you added up the total length, because the way they were designed was wasn't like a straight wall like Chi- like the Great Wall of China. It was more of a constantly outwardly looping wall for defense. Right. It the total length was longer than the Great Wall of China. Nice. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, and it cannons and cannons go boom and destroyed it. <laughs> wow! <laughs> because of course they did. Yeah. Because of course they did. Of course. Well, thank you for telling us that. I'm glad I yeah. know that now. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Everyone in the chat is just you know being sad about the sex as they should be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It was amazing. And I know it was last minute, but it's been great. Uh, it, no, it was an honor to do this. I honestly didn't at first think I was qualified to do this no. because Professor no, Holtz you are. is going to, my teacher, Professor Holtz is going to be on here and stuff Please. like that. I think, I think one thing that is wonderful about the online paleontology community of which you are a part is just that we recognize that everyone has something to contribute regardless of how much training they have. And so it's been great to hear from you. All right. All right. Thank you. So I guess I'll I'll leave and then just go back to being in the chat. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Everyone is handing you hearts, just so you know. (laughs) Out out of curiosity, uh, will there be like a recording of this uh, stream on Twitch and stuff like that? Uh, so we are currently planning to take all the different segments of this whole stream and putting them on as individual parts on YouTube. We oh, do okay. have a YouTube channel. Um, well, I do, but we're gonna put it on mine because that's where we put sweet. So oh, sweet. we're gonna cut up. Yeah, we're gonna have each of the sort of guest sections as their whole thing, and we're not entirely sure what to do with the long banter sessions. Uh, <laughs> Probably going to do highlight reels um, yeah. of the genuinely funny parts and then uh, cut out all of the Like the peeled mammoths. Uh, okay. uh, peeled mammoths. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm going to head back into the chat now and talk about peeled mammoths and, and oh, no. fossil theories. <laughs> We're right. never going to escape. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs>